This session is presented by the Embassy of Ireland. Session 55, Entangled Life, Merlin Sheldrake in conversation with Janice Parriott. When we think of fungi, fungi, we lightly think of mushrooms. But mushrooms are only fruiting bodies analogous to apples on trees. Most fungi live out of sight, yet make up a massively diverse kingdom of organisms that supports and sustains nearly all living systems. Fungi provide a key to understanding the planet on which we live and the ways we think, feel, and behave. In conversation with author Janice Barriott, Wainwright prize-winning biologist Merlin Sheldrake shows us the world from a fungal point of view, providing an exhilarating change of perspective. Sheldrake's vivid exploration takes us from yeast to psychedelics to the fungi that range from miles underground and are the largest organisms on the planet to those that link plants together in a complex networks known as the wood wide web to those that infiltrate and manipulate insects bodies with devastating precision of entangled life how fungi make our worlds change our minds and shape our futures a new york times and sunday times bestseller and the winner of the Royal Society Book Prize and the Wainwright Prize. Sheldrake is a research associate of the VU University Amsterdam and works with the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks and the Fungi Foundation. <laughs> Janice Parriott is the award-winning author of Boats on Land, a collection of short stories Seahorse, and the internationally best-selling book, The Nine-Chambered Heart. Her newest novel, Everything the Light Touches, is out in the UK, USA, and India. Janice lives between Delhi, Shillong, and teaches at Ashoka University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Merlin Sheldrake and Janice Parriott in Tangled Life, Session 55. Good afternoon, everyone, and how lovely to see all of you here. Um, it's just the most beautiful winter day, and I couldn't be more delighted to be at this session with Marlin. Really, just such joy. <laughs> um, Marlin, I was telling you just, just a moment ago that I come from um, the hills of Meghalaya, it's the wettest place on earth. And I've grown up seeing mushrooms everywhere, in the forests, in our markets, in our kitchens. We cook them, we eat them, we forage for them, we take photos of them. Um, but I think until I read your book, I'd never really thought about mushrooms very much beyond how lovely and interesting they look on a walk through the forest. Um, I think your, your book opened up some kind of wonderful, incredible portal into a mad, magical world. Um, and I, I couldn't be more grateful, really. <laughs> um, there are a few books that I've had the privilege of reading that as cliche as this might sound, have changed the way that I look at the world. Uh, there's Pranelal's Indica, uh, and also his book on viruses, very much like yours on fungi, um, called Invisible Empires. There's Robin Kimmerer, Braiding Sweetgrass, Gathering Moss. Um, there's Robert McFarland's Underland, in which you make an appearance and where I first encountered you a few years ago. So this is a lovely, ever-expanding circle. We meet long before we actually meet. 
Um, but these are books that have changed the way that I see the world because, at least for me, they offer a long perspective. They offer deep context. And they offer these vast geological timelines that really place our species right where we belong. We belong in the realm of the fleeting, of the small, of the miraculous, of the collaborative and the dependent. And I'm so, so thrilled to include your wonderful book in this list that I hold so close to my heart. So really, again, thank you for this gift of a book, Merlin. Thank you, Jenny. How are you feeling? Feeling great. Yes. Wonderful to be here. Oh. We're very grateful to be here. Well, we are very, very thrilled that you're here, Merlin. Before, um, before we leap into um, you know, our questions, would you like to just briefly read a little bit of an excerpt from, um, you know, from your book, from right at the beginning? Yeah? Of course. Um, Janice asked me to, to read a bit of the, the book, and I was initially apprehensive. Uh, I've been getting emails, quite a lot of emails, uh, from people who say, Merlin, I've had insomnia for 20 years, and uh, when I listen to your audiobook with you reading it, I can finally sleep. Uh, and it's transformed my relationship with my wife. Uh, and I just want to say thank you. So uh, I, uh, I'm a little nervous to, to bring this out here, but let's give it a go. The introduction is called, What is it like to be a fungus? And the, uh, the epigram is, a, a translation of Hafiz um, by Daniel Ladinsky. Uh, there are moments in moist love when heaven is jealous of what we on earth can do. Fungi are everywhere, but they're easy to miss. They're inside you and around you. They sustain you and all that you depend on. As you hear these words, fungi are changing the way that life happens, as they have done for more than a billion years. They're eating rock, making soil, digesting pollutants, nourishing and killing plants, surviving in space, inducing visions, producing food, making medicines, manipulating animal behavior, and influencing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Fungi provide a key to understanding the planet on which we live and the ways we think, feel, and behave. Yet their lives are lived largely hidden from view and more than 90% of their species remain undocumented. The more we learn about fungi, the less makes sense without them. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. Thank you, Merlin. Um, I'm going to begin with a question um, that actually references the very end of your book, um, the epilogue, where you, um, you conjure this wonderful image of you as a, as a little boy burrowing into a pile of leaves. And um, you, you speak about this, this experience you know, quite affectionately, quite fondly. And I feel that it's, it's quite an important point at which something began. And I know origin stories are difficult, they're messy, uh, they're not easy. Where does something really, truly begin? But um, would you like to just share with us a little bit of the beginnings of, of, of your interest and your intrigue um, in fungi? Well, there have been many beginnings. Uh, fungi live their lives in such plural ways and make such uh, jokes uh, about individuality and multiplicity that it's always difficult to have a, a single story about fungi. Um, but this is one um, that I remember from an early age. Um, and uh, I would spend a lot of time outdoors as a child. And uh, I remember making piles of leaves that had fallen in the autumn uh, in our garden. Uh, in London, and I made these piles of leaves with rakes. I'd rake, rake leaves into these big piles, and I'd hide inside these piles of leaves. Um, they were places to explore and also places to hide. And um, I was fascinated by the smells um, and the dampness and the um, 
the ways in which um, I could, um, the ways that I could find sounds and, um, and, and patterns in the darkness in these spaces. And, but the problem was that as the months went by, the piles of leaves grew smaller, uh, and they grew smaller and smaller. And in fact, it was harder and harder to hide in these piles of leaves, because of course they were rotting down. And um, I wondered how it was that these leaves could disappear. Were they sinking into the soil? If they were changing from one form into another, uh, how was this possible? And I asked my father, who's a biologist, and he explained that there were creatures who break things down and that can transform stuff from one form into another. Um, and these creatures are so small that we can't actually see them with our naked eyes. And this struck me as astonishing, and still does, um, that the great power of the organisms that decompose the world um, is uh, such a vast power that it shapes the whole biosphere, uh, and yet these organisms are too small for us to see. Uh, and so this awoke in me a fascination with decomposition and how it is that things transform, uh, that how do things change, um, how does a lump of wood become soil? Um, how does that soil go on to become a plant? How does the food that we eat in our body go on to produce the sinews and the nerves and the muscles um, in which and with which we live? Yeah, and I love how these become philosophical questions as well. They're not just about organic matter and um, you know materials within the natural world. They are asking such larger questions about who we are and why we're here and how we're all connected in, in, in some way. Um, and I think what really struck me, Marlin, right from the beginning, was even just the little um, the epigraph at the beginning of your book where you say, you know, thank you to all the fungi from whom I have learned so much. And, and I wanted to bring that up because um, I think what you're saying there is truly very, very important, especially within a scenario where science is usually done um, uh, in a way that involves an approach um, that, that categorizes and distances. It involves an approach that um, encourages scientists to pick up an object of study um, and study it um, in in, a, in an analytical, perhaps even mechanistic way, that they look at a living being, a plant, an animal, a fungus, and they say, how does it work? As though it's a machine that's a collection of parts in some ways. Um, and, I, and, I, and I wondered about the approach that you embrace, one that's much gentler, that approaches a living being as a subject where you might ask, what may I learn from you? How may I learn from you? And I wanted to know what your journey has been towards embracing that approach and why that has been, and if that has been important to you. Well, you know, there are so many ways to do science. What we call science is really the sciences, which is a, a diverse collection of practices, uh, institutions, norms, uh, ways of thinking and knowing. Um, and of course, a, a quantum physicist, a professor of quantum physics, is a layperson with regard to an expert in the study of fossilized fishes. Uh, and so um, the sciences contain all sorts of realms of, uh, of their own kinds of public and their own kinds of uh, specialist. And, um, but of the many ways of doing science, um, or the sciences, uh, the ones that I have found most exciting have been those in which I've been a field biologist. Um, and I uh, did a lot of this when I was in Panama working at a wonderful field station run by the Smithsonian called the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Uh, and at this place, there were all sorts of people who had come to study the tropical forests there. And in tropical forests, there are so many ways to be alive. Uh, there are so many more ways to be alive than there are in uh, temperate forests that I was used to uh, from growing up in England. Uh, and, and the diversity of the forest was uh, matched by the diversity of the scientists who'd come there to study it. There were people who tempted down lightning strikes with helium balloons on copper wires they had to lift up during storms, uh, at great risk to themselves. 
uh, and there were people who followed the monkeys um, because they were trying to find out um, whether the monkeys were drunk by eating overripe fruit. So they had to okay. follow the monkeys around with a funnel uh, uh, to, to catch their urine uh, in the small jars. Um, there were all sorts of people there. Uh, and um, one of the things that linked us all was that we were field biologists. We were uh, going into the ecosystem that we hoped to understand. Um, when I spent time being a lab biologist, uh, I spent my life very much in charge of the fragments of life that I study. And a bit of life that I'm studying is taking place in tubes or vials or flasks in incubators. Uh, and I have a kind of uh, a god role in relation to that little fragment of life in the sense that I am in charge uh, of all the variables that it's going to uh, be exposed to. But when you're a field biologist, you're in the flask. The world is the flask. And you're in the flask with everybody else. Um, and so a sense of humility sets in. A, a sense of not being in charge sets in. A, a sense of having to listen sets in. And these, I feel, are very good places from which to ask questions about a vast, wild, wet world uh, that has been going on for so much longer than we can even imagine. Um, and I think what I love about what you're saying just now is how when you say you place yourself within the vial, within the test tube, so to speak, you are bringing in your own physical body. You're bringing in performativity, as you said. Um, and you are part of the thing that you are studying. Um, the distance collapses. Um, and you become, or at least you, you try and acknowledge um, how you play a part in the experiment as much as what you are trying to, um, trying to study. Um, I think what I love about these books, um, Pranelal's, Kimara, McFarlane, and yours, is how much I learn, of course, when I'm reading them. Um, astonishing, you know, bits of information, facts, experiences, um, uh, and illuminations. But I think what is as powerful and as awe-inspiring is coming across how we don't know so much. I mean, your book is peppered with you and your colleagues and your collaborators and other scientists just throwing your hands up in the air saying, we don't know. We don't know how um, you know, this happens. We don't know how this fungi makes this decision at this point and why. And given this set of options, why it does this, we don't quite know. We don't quite know how it controls this ant. We don't quite know how life began. <laughs> um, and we are staring at this, this not knowing in the face. And somewhere in your book, you say uncertainty is healthy, um, but I'd love for you to share and expand on what your relationship is with this deep mystery at the heart of all life. One of the reasons why I like studying fungi uh, is because we know so little about the lives of these organisms. They have been uh, comparatively neglected um, fungi were only, um, m they only became a kingdom of life um, in the late 60s. That's when they won their independence, taxonomically speaking. Um, they were before that considered to be lower plants and were studied in dusty and unglamorous corners of botany schools. Um, and so um, the, the world of fungi is a world of um, mystery. You're always just even a half step away from a, a, a frontier of knowledge and inquiry. Uh, and all sorts of interesting things happen there, I find. Um, and one of the things that happens there is that one has to grow to find comfort in the space created by open questions. The questions that tug us forwards into inquiry, um, that invite us to pay attention, uh, and to not build small rooms from quick answers, uh, not to... Um, to uh, reach for certainty, 
Um, of course, we do need some certainty. We need, <laughs> we need stability in some ways, otherwise we wouldn't have uh, any grounds on which to make an inquiry. Um, but, but I find that, that, that sense of the open question, the open question is the one that invites you forward into its presence. Uh, uh, once you've answered a question, in a sense you've killed that question. That question is no longer live uh, as, as a summoning attractor. Um, so that's one of the ways that I think about mysteries <coughs> and questions in the realm of scientific inquiry. Um, and, um, and a lot of the time it's learning to, to feel comfortable in those disorienting and confusing spaces where uh, one wants to collapse ambiguity. Um, yes. One wants to reduce uh, a wildly complex situation into um, isolated individual units. Uh, and sometimes we need to do that. But, um, but uh, I find it's much more fun to, to, to look into the big question. Yes, yes, yes. and to say we don't know. And it's an, it's an act of vulnerability, um, and it's an act of being deeply human to say we don't know, and we're trying to find out, and we don't know if we will ever know, and whether we will ever find it all out, but we try. When I, was writing, uh, when I was writing Entangled Life, there were times when my editor had said, um, Merlin, we've you've got to dial down the ignorance just a little bit because you've got to be a trustworthy narrator. Otherwise, no one's going to believe anything you say. And I was like, OK, fair enough. I'll, I'll dial down the ignorance in a little bit. Just, um, and so yeah, this is a constant dance that we have both in, uh, in inquiring but also in talking about um, the sciences. And, and, and the ways that people um, talk about the sciences in the past, perhaps a more old-fashioned form of science communication has been um, very much the kind of, um, we now know. Um, and no, I'm the scientist, and I'm going to that diffuse, tone. Yeah, yes. um, diffusing knowledge uh, to a um, to a lay audience. But I find that I learn much more, and I've been taught much more about science by those teachers that have invited me into the questions uh, and, and shown me a little bit how to navigate them. Um, and so that's, um, I think, a very productive way to move yes. forward. Yes. Um, your book is about fungi, of course, as we know, but it is so much also about language. Um, and in so many ways, it's about beautiful writing, beautiful sentences, sentences that startle and surprise. And there is this wonderful narrative rhythm that you build. So there are all of these elements of craft at play. But it got me thinking about language um, on a slightly sort of broader, larger level, and how perhaps knowing or beginning to know or beginning to understand the natural world is very much about expanding our, our language. So much um, of your book is about how certain words were coined, how they came into being, ecology, symbiosis. Um, and Goethe, who is, as we know, a wonderful, wonderful um, scientist as well as a playwright and a poet, once said, a plant, an animal, a fungus, we add, um, is its own language. Um, and I was wondering, how, how do we learn that language? Is there a way to learn those words? And is this where we might involve things like art and poetry? Is this where, um, you know, these often disparate disciplines or seemingly disparate si disciplines come together in some way for you? I think so. Uh, I think that's a, a very good way of putting it. Mm. Um, I've always found myself frustrated by the boundaries that have been erected between the sciences and the arts. Uh, after all, uh, what we call art and science uh, both arise from our faculties of wonder, of curiosity, uh, of fascination, yeah. um, both about the world unfolding around us, but also with our own abilities to meaningfully experience those phenomena. Uh, and these, um, this unfortunate bifurcation, um, which I think is, um, you can trace back quite a long way, but, but one place that uh, is made very clear is in Galileo, where he divides the world into primary quantities, those things we can measure, uh, and secondary qualities. And the qualities are things like color and taste and uh, friendship and love, all the exciting things. Um, 
Uh, and science um, could deal with the things that we could measure, and the arts would deal with all those other things. But, but really, um, scientists have never been um, cold-blooded, rational, purely rational human beings. Uh, scientists are intuitive, creative, um, emotional uh, souls um, engaged in all sorts of, of wild uh, and confusing lives, struggling to make sense of a world that was never made to be catalogued and systematized. And so when we try to step back beyond this duality, this vexed duality, uh, and into our full selves, I, I think we stand a much better chance of understanding the world because we are, in that sense, stepping into the world as a full organism rather than an organism that has been divided through uh, disciplinary division upon division upon division. Yeah. I do love your accounts of uh, being a field biologist in, in, in Panama. They are fascinating and hilarious um, all at the same time. And, um, you know, there was an observation there that you shared um, that the bat scientists who you encountered um, were in some ways behaving like bats while studying bats. They stayed up late at night or stayed up all night and, and, and took on very bat-like qualities um, while, you know, proceeding with their research. And, of course, they turned the question on to you. Um, how has fungi imprinted um, <laughs> upon <laughs> you? And you very delicately say in the book, I'm still not sure. But of course, this is the perfect time to bring this up and ask you again. Have there been any new illuminations um, since the book was published and, 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 and until now? I mean, in, in, on a more serious note, how has um, studying fungi, how has writing this book changed you, transformed you as a person, as a scientist, as a writer? Um, how, how has looking into the network, how has the network looking back at you changed you? It's a beautiful question. Um, so there are some, uh, some sort of literal ways and, and, and obvious ways. I, I spent a lot of my research rootling around in the soil, um, scratching, sniffing, um, uh, licking um, bits of soil, roots. Uh, I, I think in this sort of way, the sort of head first into the muck, um, it, it, it's one way you can think of that as a quite fungal. Um, and I have a fascination for the smells of um, rotting wood and, uh, and this kind of thing. Um, but um, I think there are other ways. So fungi live most of their lives. So we think of mushrooms usually when we think of fungi, but most fungi live most of their lives as mycelial networks. And this is a name given to the, um, the main lifestyle that fungi occupy. And these are branching, fusing networks of tubular cells. Um, they don't have a center of operation. They don't have a head uh, or a heart like we do. They have fantastical uh, regenerative capacities. You can take a fragment of a mycelial network and it will become a whole new network. These networks can be so small as to fit on a speck of house dust, uh, or they can be some of the largest organisms in the world and sprawl over kilometers. So mycelium is a way of life that really challenges our animal imaginations in our, our, our centralized bodies and our um, uh, ways of thinking about um, centers. We have capital cities and heads of state, uh, for example. Uh, I think it really goes very deep. So thinking about mycelium and trying to make sense of this uh, way of life has really, I think, changed me. And it's, um, it's changed the way that I think about my mind. Uh, I, I, I feel like my mind and maybe um, the minds of, of others as well uh, are, are branching, fusing, um, ephemeral, centerless, um, organisms, in a sense. So I, so I started to think of my mind as its own um, exploring uh, organism in a way that I didn't think of it before. Uh, and, and a way that, um, yes, I kind of, uh, I guess when we draw mind maps, they look rather like fungal networks. Um, and so, yes, I've started to think of mycelium as a kind of 
portrait uh, of a mind. Uh, and I sort of think of my mind as being rather like a mycelium. Yes, and I think that sort of very gently and very sort of wonderfully leads us into my next question, which was, you know, about the human, of course, and what you, um, what you describe on your website as the more than human, which I thought was such an interesting and incredibly important substitution for the usual term, which is the non-human, right? Uh, the more than human. And I think we've, you know, we've encountered that in your book as well. You, you speak about how scientists, all of us, we are limited in our worldview because we are we can't quite help it, we are exceedingly human-centric. Um, and so we tend to you know, study the, the more than human in certain human-centric ways. Um, but what could make us acknowledge the more than human in better and more um, meaningful ways? Yeah, just this, this term I find very helpful. It was um, coined by a, an uncle brother of mine called uh, David Abram, who's a, an ecologist and a philosopher. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a term that I find invites me into humility. Um, and I find that just a helpful place to begin my day <laughs> and to begin any inquiry. Um, and so, um, so yes, yeah, so, so that, that, that term does a lot of work uh, for me personally, and, and, um, and especially as, uh, as an ecologist, trying to understand uh, the tangled networks that are the living world, these um, wild um, improvisational um, relationships that, that we are surrounded by. So, um, but how can, we, how can we connect with the more than human? I think we all have very different ways of doing that. Uh, it might be so simple as um, growing, a, growing microgreens on your uh, balcony. Um, you might go and bury your hands in the soil. You might have a pet that you live with and, and adore and who consoles you and comforts you. Um, you might um, look at a patch of sky um, and see the clouds, which are of course water vapor and released by trees transpiring in a forest somewhere, uh, and see that as part of this living world and a living biosphere. So I think we will have different ways to do that. Um, and so I wouldn't want to um, suggest one. Is there a moment of wonder that really, really stands out to you? Is there a moment in your wild journeys and, and, and long days of research, long years of research, is there a moment that stands out to you um, where you felt at one with the world? I think we, we've all perhaps felt that at some point, standing on top of a mountain or looking at a waterfall or being in a forest where we felt so connected and so small and so part of something larger that it's, it's difficult to place into words. I think that when we talk about the more than human, we are also limited so much by language. We have no words to describe these feelings, but I think you know what I mean, and I think you know what I mean. Is there a moment that stands out to you, Merlin? There are so many of these moments. Um, and so many of these moments have happened outside, uh, being in beautiful places, um, sometimes ha be ha being in very, what I thought at first was a not a very beautiful place. Um, sometimes it's happened indoors, um, where I, I lose the sense of where uh, I stop and where the world begins. Because of course we are porous. Um, we are all porous in constant fluid exchange with our surroundings and just, I think remembering that porosity <clears throat> is something that helps me to um, connect. But some of the times that do stand out for me uh, more precisely, I suppose, would be um, looking down microscopes. Mm. Uh, and it might seem counterintuitive um, because this normally happens in a lab. Uh, and, but <clears throat> looking at fungi down microscopes, uh, I, I, I look at um, fungi that relates to plants and that live in and around plant roots 
uh, called mycorrhizal fungi. And these fungi, uh, uh, they've shaped life on Earth in the sense that plants would never have made it out of the water and onto the land were it not for these fungi um, that behaved as their root system for tens of millions of years until plants could evolve their own roots. And so there's all sorts of wonderful things about these fungi, but I was looking at the, the ways that they live inside plant roots. And so you, you pick some roots up from the, the, the soil and you treat them in a certain way and you'd stain them and you'd um, all these this apparatus of death, right? Killing the root, boiling the root, clearing it, staining it with a poisonous dye. Um, but then you put it under a, in a slide uh, under a microscope. And what you see is an intertwining. You see the fungus clasping the plant cells, growing inside the plant cells. The plant cells have let the fungus grow inside their cells. Um, they've both suspended their normal rules of engagement. They're busy defending each other from things that would cause harm to them lots of the time. But they have found each other, they've clasped each other. Uh, they are um, locked in a fantastical embrace, uh, an embrace that gives life both to each other but also grounds the whole biosphere in which we live. And to see these under a microscope, which is a bit like um, going for a dive, I suppose, going for a dive in the very small. Uh, I've had um, very striking experiences in those moments. That's just so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Marlin. I'm tearing up. <laughs> um, but I love this idea of, of, of entanglement and interconnectivity, of course, at this microscopic cellular level. And I was wondering how that um, extends to the act of you eating your book. <laughs> if you check um, Merlin's Instagram page, you will see that there's a little video of his book being, <laughs> and YouTube, being gently devoured by oyster mushrooms. And I think about a week, seven days later, Merlin cooks up the oyster mushrooms and eats them. You also mention in your book that you were hoping to make a mead from the sugars of the paper um, that make up your book and drink that mead. And of course, this is all wonderful and playful and, and, and cheeky and, and, and very clever, but is, is there more to it? Is, is there a meaning to ingesting your words in this way that, that have meant something very powerful to you? Well, well I had always wanted to eat my words, and so, so there, was, <laughs> <laughs> there was that. Um, but uh, on, on a more serious note, uh, you know, there's, there's a sense in which writing a book is, I've been writing this book about the living world, about all the, the wild lives unfolding around us. And here I was, stuck in a small, darkened room, staring at a screen um, and feeling increasingly uh, distanced from the world that I was discussing. Um, and um, so I, I, wanted to, I wanted to fold these words and this process back into the organic cycles that I was talking about into the book. I wanted to let the book um, meet the rot <laughs> the meat, the decomposition um, that it contains words of. Um, and, and it was a way of reminding myself that, um, that all of this still existed when I came out of my writing room uh, and went outside, that yes, the world was still there. <laughs> yes, here they all are, uh, doing their decomposition and their composition. Um, and, uh, and yes, here this very book is now um, a rotted, um, pile sprouting delicious mushrooms. Um, and so it was, uh, it was all of those things. For me. And did you make it into a mead as well? Yes, I, I, I fried them lightly with, I didn't add garlic because I wanted to taste the, the, the mushrooms without any uh, garlic. So I kept it simple. Um, and I couldn't taste any off notes, which was <laughs> any, <laughs> all, all the dreadful, dreadful grammar <laughs> and, and a horrifically misplaced semicolons had been metabolized by the funky. They have a habit of doing this, of turning our poisonous oversights into something magical. Uh, and there it was, a, a bona fide oyster mushroom that tasted like a bona fide oyster mushroom. <laughs> Nothing better. <laughs> Um, before we open up uh, to the audience, and I'm sure you have lots and lots of questions for Marlin, um, I just wanted to bring up um, 
what you talk about towards the latter half of your book, which I think is deeply important, given the kind of ecological crisis that we are in the middle of, um, um, living in these times, as they say. But I wanted to bring up radical mycology um, and how this has been important for you, what your journey has been towards perhaps encountering and embracing radical mycology, and, and what kind of part does it play um, you know, in your life as, as, as a scientist? So there are so many ways that fungi have shaped human life uh, for an unknowably long time, uh, as medicines and as food, uh, as uh, the ancient life support systems that give rise to plants. Whenever we cultivate a plant, we're cultivating fungi, whether or not we know it. Um, so uh, human stories are, are, are in some way always fungal stories. And um, as we um, look towards the future of life on a damaged planet, there are lots of ways that we might start to imagine new types of relationships with fungi that can help us adapt. Um, some of these might look like um, inviting fungi to digest some of the poisonous uh, oversights, our, our polluted environments. So fungi have prodigious metabolic abilities and very Catholic tastes, uh, and they can eat uh, all sorts of things, from cigarette butts to um, kerosene. There's a kerosene fungus that lives in the fuel tanks of aircraft. As you can imagine, this causes problems. Uh, there's a specialist mold that lives off evaporating whiskey in Canadian distilleries. Um, and so uh, there are lots of um, ways that we might be able to um, recruit fungi to, to help us digest some of our problems in quite a literal way. Of course, we've been doing this for a very long time uh, in jars and bottles, uh, miso, um, soy sauce, these are all fungal processes. Of course, alcohol, um, bread, these are overseen by yeasts. Um, and so um, there's a long story of us thinking about fungal metabolisms as prostheses for our own more limited metabolisms. And this is one way. Um, there are other ways. We might think about, um, we might think, uh, there's so many, um, <laughs> there's ways we can build materials using fungi. And this is quite a, a new field. Uh, you can encourage fungi to grow around um, uh, corn stalks or sawdust that you've packed into a mold shaped like a brick. Uh, and the fungus weaves together this material into a kind of composite, which you can then dry uh, and then use as a brick to build things with. You can encourage fungal mycelium to grow uh, into a kind of foam, which you can then tan into a leather-like material. Um, and this can all happen in a matter of two weeks uh, on agricultural waste uh, without the need for huge areas um, to graze animals on and uh, on all the attendant um, problems and cruelty that associated with industrial um, meat worlds uh, and leather worlds. So um, there are ways that we can think about uh, building things with fungi. There are um, also ways to think about um, reforming our uh, increasingly dysfunctional in industrial agricultural systems, um, which are in so many ways are, uh, are death, uh, death giving systems, um, systems that issue uh, mechanized death to organisms in the soil um, through the application of poisons, um, and which disrupt so many um, intimate reciprocal dependencies that have evolved over a very long time. Um, so we might think about um, uh, reforming agriculture and forestry um, by thinking about not just the plants we're growing, but the magnitude uh, of their underground uh, relationships, um, fungal relationships. There are, um, there are so many, yes. so many things. Yes. Um, yes. There are, of course, all the ways that fungi encourage us to uh, change the way that we think and feel uh, and imagine. Oh, oh, and of course, there's drugs. Um, yes. Let's not forget drugs. <laughs> um, penicillin is something that we yes. talk about a lot, which transform modern medicine. Um, but there's uh, cyclosporin, which is a drug which is an immunosuppressant that makes organ transplants possible. Um, there are uh, the, the full litany of uh, fungal drugs would take mm. months to recite, uh, so I won't. <laughs> um, but there's all sorts of possibility uh, as we move forwards to um, find new ways of, of healing and curing mm. uh, using fungi. And these all fall within the ambit of what's called radical mycology, of, of thinking about um, fungi in these new and innovative 
ways. Um, is, is, am I right? Well, well, Radical Mycology is the, is, is the name of an organization in, in ah. the United States, and I, I use it in the, in the book as it, is, is a kind of catch-all term for right. uh, thinking about these ways that we can right. Um, right. form radical partnerships with right. fungi, uh, which of course we have been doing for a very for long time. Any, yes. um, but um, but no, but that refers particularly to these communities of uh, citizen scientists, DIY mycologists, um, amateurs in the true sense of yeah. the word amateur, from the Latin I love, um, uh, are doing wild and wonderful things with fungi and experimenting in uh, astonishing ways, a, a kind of efflorescence mm. uh, of, of, um, of improvisational um, relationship forming right. um, with fungi. Right, okay. Thank you. Let's just quickly open up to the audience. I can see there is, um, before we run out entirely of time, there's a lady there, um, uh, right there next to the stand, next to the camera stand, and there's a gentleman there as well. And there's a lady at the back. Maybe we take three questions, yeah? Okay. There's the, the lady behind you, she had her hand up. No? She doesn't seem to have it any longer. Oh, right. OK. <laughs> you talk about fungi as small organisms which have a large network. Corals are also similar, small organisms which have a large network. What are the similarities and differences between corals and fungi? Sorry, I didn't catch. Between corals. Oh, corals. Corals. Yeah. Ah. Coral reefs. Yes. They are also small. I mean, they're animals, but they're also small and which are networks. Well, there's a great many different organisms that, that form um, complex uh, networks. And, and corals are a really small. good example. And, uh, and of course, they're symbiotic um, structures as well. Um, uh, and so they emerge from relationship um, between very different organisms, but then they uh, emerge from the relationships um, to other parts of the, of the coral reef itself. Um, and of course, they are then sustained by the many lives that live in and around the reef. So um, I would say um, that they're very much their, um, their own way of doing network, but that they illustrate, like fungi, um, a very basic fact about life, uh, that life is relationship. Um, and relationships often take the form of networks, networks, whether as structures or networks of flux and exchange. Um, and that's, um, you know, big bacteria have small bacteria living inside them and large viruses can have small viruses living inside them. Um, and so life is relationship and, 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 and so corals like fungi remind us of this and, and remind us that it's very important, I think at least, uh, to think about the relationships between organisms as much as we do the organisms doing the relating. Wonderful talk, fantastic book, and I'm delighted to see that Ireland is supporting you. Um, in, uh, might it be that um, funguses can work on inorganic materials? I mean, could they be set to work on the modulation of rubbish, such as plastic, all over this beautiful country? Um, it'd be, I'm wondering if, it's, if they can function to break down inorganic material? Um, yes, in a word. Uh, there are uh, much of the ways that they play roles within, um, within life worlds is by mining minerals from rock, inorganic minerals from rock, by burrowing into rock and releasing chemicals and acids, which um, can bring many of these um, inorganic chemicals into the metabolic cycles of the living. Uh, they have that intermediary role uh, between life and uh, what we might think of as non-life. Um, but also plastics, yes, there are uh, fungi that can digest some plastics, uh, not all, and plastics have quite different um, structures, but there's very exciting work uh, happening on this front. Um, and, uh, and no doubt many more um, metabolic abilities will surface. The way that these people studying the plastics do it is they go to rubbish dumps and they see which fungi are thriving there uh, in among the plastic, because in some sense we've created them a, a, a perfect habitat. So go find them at home. Wonderful. Are we done? Okay. We do have one last question from the lady there who's had her hand up for a very long time. Quickly. 
Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to ask this question. I would like to know what is the philosophical aspect of fungi? Oh, we might need an entirely new <laughs> session on that. Um, In three words, Merlin. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many different philosophies one could r read and think with fungi, but the philosophies that I have found most helpful to make sense of fungal life uh, are those um, arising from um, the German idealist philosophers like Schelling, um, Bergson, and, and particularly Alfred North Whitehead, who has uh, an organic um, metaphysics, so a way of thinking about uh, the whole universe as an organism. Um, atoms and molecules are very small organisms, and we're larger organisms, but the sun uh, is a much larger organism, and galaxies themselves are, are organisms too. Um, strikes me that to understand an organic world, it helps if we have a, an organic metaphysics. Wonderful. Thank you, Merlin. Thank you. We would like to thank Merlin Sheldrake and Janice Barriott for this enlightening conversation. We thank the Embassy of Ireland for the support. May I request everyone to join me in giving a huge round of applause to Merlin Sheldrake and Janice Barriott for this enriching. There, there, there.